Good morning. The first item of business this morning is general questions. And as ever, in order to get as many people in as possible, uh, short and succinct questions and answers to match would be appreciated. Question number one, Murdo Fraser. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it is on track to meet its fuel poverty eradication target. Minister Margaret Burgess. This Government remains committed to eradicating fuel poverty. Unfortunately, we only have the powers to influence one of the levers to tackle fuel poverty, the energy efficiency of the House. As the most recent Scottish House Conditions Survey result, results show, our investment to improve domestic energy efficiency has helped mitigate against the 7% rise in fuel prices in the past year. We continue to focus on increasing the energy efficiency of homes in Scotland, and last week I urged the UK Government to use its powers to increase the level of warm home discount and fund that through central resources. And today we are publishing a progress report on the Scottish Government's fuel poverty statement. Martha Fraser. Uh, can I thank the Minister for her response? We are, of course, going backwards in relation to this target, which will now need to be met within two years. What assessment has the Scottish Government made of the cost of meeting this target? Minister. I think, as I said in my earlier answer, we published the progress report today, and that will be available for all members to see. We are currently spending unprecedented amounts of money in uh, energy efficiency of homes. We spent £94 million uh, this year and £94 million next year leaving in money from the energy companies of over £260 million. So we are doing everything we can to, uh, for f energy efficiency measures in homes. What we can't do is control the prices or the minimum income to improve people's standard of living. Thank you. Question number two, John McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether the recruitment of consultants in Scotland could be affected by any move to privatise NHS services in England. Cabinet Secretary, Shona Robson. NHS Scotland offers consultant staff the opportunity to work in a world-class healthcare system in modern and well-equipped hospitals on competitive terms and conditions which offer a good work-life balance. We'll continue to look at ways and how we can uh, attract the best talent to NHS Scotland and we of course will monitor to see if there is any impact from the direction of travel in England on our ability to recruit to vacant posts. Joan McAlpine. Thank you. The Minister may be aware that Dumfries and Galloway has one of the highest levels of consultant vacancies in Scotland, if not the highest. While many factors feed into this, I was alarmed to be told recently by Health Board contacts that the increase in the amount of private work that consultants in England can undertake was affecting Dumfries and Galloway Health Board's ability to recruit. Does the Minister agree with me that this illustrates very clearly that changes to the NHS in England can have a detrimental effect on our independent NHS here in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the board has advised us that there may be a recent case whereby a consultant resigned due to the inability to undertake private work. Um, however, in addition, the board has advised it's just started a new piece of work to measure and improve knowledge around its own workforce. This work started approximately two months ago and the board has undertaken to keep us up to date on progress. Uh, just to say to the member as well, I mean, we are undertaking a, a large amount of work, particularly around those key specialities that have the highest vacancy levels that are the least attractive posts because we do recognise that uh, we need to do more to make sure that those posts, particularly in more remote and rural areas, are, are more attractive. And I can write to the member to make her aware of some of the detail on that. Richard Simpson. Yes. <clears throat> can I suggest that the private practice element is a total distraction? What the cab new Cabinet Secretary might like to look at is the freedom of information response that I received from boards, which indicated that far from providing consultants with a 7.5 to 2.5 sessional contract, which is the national contract, 60% of all new consultant contracts in Scotland have been offered on a 9-1 basis. This is unsustainable, untenable, and frankly, any consultant that actually accepts the job on that basis, in comparison to the national contract that are offered in England, is, is, uh, is brilliant from our point of view, but actually is making a big sacrifice. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I hope Richard Simpson isn't trying to deter consultants from taking up posts within the, the Scottish Health Service, because that would be a, a very negative uh, uh, thing to do indeed. Uh, we are looking absolutely across how the, the whole of the NHS in Scotland about how do we 
uh, fill the consultant vacancies. Of course, one of the reasons that we have consultant vacancies is that we have more consultant posts uh, to fill because of the massive expansion in posts across the health service, including uh, consultant posts. The consultant establishment in Scotland has grown massively. There are absolutely record numbers of consultants, but there are harder to fill specialities, particularly in emergency medicine. We've responded to that in a number of, a way, number of ways. A number of NHS boards have established local medical bank services, for example, which have been very good indeed. But we are looking at the way, ways of improving working lives and the work-life balance, the working hours of junior doctors with the recent announcements about limiting the amount of days and nights that they can work. Uh, and uh, I will indeed uh, be looking at how else we can make sure that we can fill these vacancies. But, of course, it is with a background of having more posts than ever before. Question three, Adam Ingram. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what information it has about trends in the use of food banks in Scotland. Minister Margaret Burgess. There is no comprehensive national level data collection on those accessing emergency food in Scotland. However, on 24 November, the Trussell Trust reported that a total of 51,647 people picked up a three-day supply of groceries from their Scottish food banks between April and September 2014. Of those, 15,424 were children. The total number had risen 124% since the previous year. The Trust highlighted welfare problems, welfare problems as the biggest contributor to these numbers, stating that benefit changes and benefit delays have had a real impact this year. Adam Ingram. I thank the Minister for her answer, a very disappointing answer. Can I ask her, will the welfare powers coming to the Parliament from the Smith Commission process allow us to turn back and eradicate the shameful growth of food poverty in this country created by UK austerity policies? Minister? I think I would certainly agree with the member. Can we do something about the Minister's microphone? Okay. We have made it perfectly. No. It seems to be. Could you try again, Minister? OK, as we've made clear repeatedly, we welcome the new powers that will be coming to this Parliament. We will always use these powers to act in the best interests of the people of Scotland. But research shows that the UK Government's welfare reforms are a major cause of some of the big issues our country faces, like addressing the worrying rise of people visiting food banks. The Smith Commission proposals, sadly, don't give us the powers to tackle these issues effectively and coherently. Question number four, Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on NHS Lanarkshire's out of hours service. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. All territorial NHS boards are responsible for the design, delivery, and management of out of hours services to their population. NHS boards are responsible for ensuring an accessible process of public consultation it is deployed for any proposed service change which may affect users. NHS Lanarkshire have informed us of their plans for public consultation on changes to their out of hours services. They have also informed the Scottish Health, Co Health Council, whose role it is to ensure that their patient engagement responsibility is being honoured. Lynn Smith. Thank you. Well, clearly. President officer, the service is under pressure in NHS Lanarkshire and the two options that the Minister mentioned are consulting on are having either a centre in both Hamilton and Airdrie or only one in Hamilton. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that it would be unacceptable for my constituents to lose their local service in Airdrie and if so, would she take steps to ensure that the board are clear that that is not really an option at all? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as Elaine Smith will be aware, there has already been extensive consultation with stakeholders and during the three-month consultation, we expect NHS Lanarkshire to ensure that potentially affected people and communities have the information and support they need to play a full part in the process. And I'm sure that Elaine Smith's constituents uh, and herself will do uh, just that. They also have to demonstrate, of course, that there has been a, a wide-ranging consultation that has taken all reasonable steps to take account of any differences of view, which 
Um, Elaine Smith has obviously highlighted uh, that there is. Uh, the Scottish Health Council will work closely with the board throughout the process to make sure that they adhere to the proper engagement process. If the board wishes to proceed with a proposal to change services following the consultation process, it should uh, enclose the Scottish Health Council's assessment report when submitting, submitting its proposal to Scottish ministers for approval in due course. So uh, I'm sure Elaine Smith will find uh, her way of influencing that consultation process. Of course, it will come to me uh, at some stage in the process should they proceed. Um, but I'm very happy to continue a dialogue with Elaine Smith if she would find that helpful. Question five, Margaret McDougall. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what road improvements in North Ayrshire are planned over the next five years. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, the Scottish Government are currently progressing schemes in North Ayrshire at Dalry and Beath, and these will be taken forward to construction subject to satisfactory completion of the statutory process. Some £7.3 million worth of structural maintenance works is also included in the current three year rolling maintenance programme. Ka One moment, Ms McDougall. Whoever's got the phone on, can they just switch it off? Ms McDougall. Thank you. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Minister, will, Cabinet Secretary will know that the A78 is defined as a, a strategic route by North Ayrshire Council for heavy goods vehicles. Furthermore, this would be the key route for the transportation of radioactive waste to Hunterston if SEPA accept EDF's application. Given there has been numerous accidents on this road, and the road passes very close to the front of houses with no footpath between in some cases, what assurances can the Minister or the Cabinet Secretary, I do apologise, give that the Scottish Government is considering upgrading this road to improve safety for residents, pedestrians and other road users, particularly if SEPA accept EDF's application? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we are concerned, of course, with safety on the A78, and for that reason, a range of measures have been put in place to manage vehicle speeds at points, for example, at Fairley, uh, where we've included new signs and markings, uh, improved road markings, and new vehicle activated signs. We're also investigating whether a speed reduction measure can be installed at Fairley that will see the traffic signals at activated to red when vehicles uh, approach them. However, I take the point uh, that's been made about the, the wider uh, issue of the transportation of radioactive waste, and if the member would wish to have a meeting with the uh, Transport Minister uh, on that issue, I'm sure that can be arranged if she's looking for further information on that. But she should be assured that we are taking measures across the A78 in terms of safety, not so much in relation to the radioactive waste transportation, which may happen, but generally in relation to large, heavy vehicles going through some of the areas that she's described. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I look forward to the conclusion of the public local inquiry into Dorai Bypass uh, in January of next year. But will the Cabinet Secretary continue, along with his predecessor, to meet with local community representatives in Cunningham North to discuss safety improvements to the A78, over which his Transport Minister had responsibility, and indeed which he uh, did on a number of occasions uh, in recent months? Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> Yes, I think, President Officer, in this case I may be my own predecessor, but um, I'm more than happy to ensure that uh, uh, more than happy to ensure that the Transport Minister carries on that engagement, which is very important to the local communities on that route, and, and I'll make sure that's passed on to the Transport Minister. I'm still trying to work that one out. Question number six, Cameron Buchanan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it plans to introduce initiatives to encourage cycling beyond its present commitments. Cabinet Secretary, Keith Brown. Uh, yes, we are committed to delivering the shared vision set out in the Cycling Action Plan for Scotland of ensuring that 10 per cent of everyday journeys are made by bike by 2020. And to do so, we will continue to invest in both new and improved on-road and off-road cycle routes and behaviour change initiatives that encourage people to choose cycling for shorter journeys. Cameron Buchanan. His response. The Scottish Government will receive an additional £213 million in Barnet consequentials as a result of the autumn statement. Will the Government spend any of this money on the cycling infrastructure? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the member will be aware that the Deputy First Minister has already announced, uh, subsequent to his uh, budget announcement, an additional £10 million for active travel uh, and sustainable travel in this area. So additional resources uh, are certainly being looked at in relation to this. However, the 
consequentials that are mentioned by Cameron Buchanan really should be uh, uh, subject to further scrutiny by the Conservative Party, because I think they've nominated it to the use of that for all sorts of different purposes, including health, including uh, an upgrade to the A1, including um, uh, upgrades to roads in the northeast of Scotland. It can't be spent more than once. But I think in relation to the basic point of his question, he should be assured that the Deputy First Minister has already made a commitment for an additional £10 million of funding in 2015-16 allocated for support for sustainable and active travel. Question 7, Angus Macdonald. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with Falkirk Council and West Lothian Council regarding the upgrading of the A801 River Avon Gorge crossing. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, since Mr Macdonald and I met to discuss this matter in April, Transport Scotland officials have met with both councils to discuss the A801 project on several occasions. Angus Macdonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. As you will know, the A801 forms a key strategic link between the M8 and the M9 corridors and provides a strategic freight route between Grangemouth Docks and various distribution centres in West Lothian. Clearly, the business communities in both council areas are keen to see the project move forward with an agreement to proceed. On the basis of a 25-25-50 split in funding and in the spirit of Christmas, can the Cabinet Secretary give any indication as to when funding might be available to ensure this long overdue project proceeds? Cabinet Secretary. In the spirit of Christmas, President Officer, I can say that the Scottish Government has already approved uh, the tax incremental financing business case from Falkirk Council. Uh, and that case envisages a £6.67 million contribution from the TIF towards a the A801 Avon Gorge upgrade, with further contributions assumed both from West Lothian Council and the Scottish Government. The business case itself uh, notes that in due course a review will be required to confirm that the upgrade is viable to commence. Any potential allocation of funding to this project by the Scottish Government will be determined by its fit with other ministerial priorities and, of course, the availability of resources in future spending reviews. Question number eight, Neil Findlay. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of how local government services impact on various social groups. Minister Marco Biaggi. The Scottish Government is strongly committed to reducing inequality and poverty across Scotland. The National Performance Framework sets out in the purpose and the national outcomes a clear and unified vision for the kind of Scotland we want to see and how our actions will improve the quality of life for the people of Scotland. It uses a wide range of indicators that provide a broad measure of national and societal well-being, incorporating a range of economic, social and environmental indicators and targets. Local authorities and their partner bodies in community planning partnerships are expected to ensure that each of their local priorities aligns with one or more of the national outcomes. Neil Findlay. Unlike his predecessor, will the new minister acknowledge that his government's local government budget cuts and the shackling of our councils has impacted most on the services for the young, the elderly, the disabled and the vulnerable? Is he proud of that? Minister. <laughs> Well, the face may have changed as Minister for Local Government, but the questions from Mr Findlay are still the same. <laughs> the, the fact is... Order. The fact is... And Order. just as my predecessor said this, I will say this as well. The share of expenditure going to local government is higher now than it was in 2006, 2007, when Mr Findlay's party was in power. And the council tax freeze has ensured that there is a broad benefit to households across Scotland, which has actually helped the bottom 10% by income twice as much proportionally as the top 10%. It's up to local councils to set their own priorities, having fulfilled their statutory obligations. And we are very happy to continue that dialogue, that process, to ensure that councils do deliver for the people in their areas. Question number nine, Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it considers that Glasgow City Council provision in the west of the city is meeting the Government's aim of providing expanded funding, early learning and childcare. Minister Aileen Campbell. Glasgow City Council, like all local authorities, has a statutory duty to secure early learning and childcare for eligible children whose parents wish it. When a child becomes eligible, local authorities will do their best to meet the needs of each parent and can offer places through their own settings or through private and third sector providers. And we would expect local authorities to do their best to meet the needs of parents. The Children and Young People Act puts flexibility on a statutory footing for the first time. Local authorities are now required to consult with groups of parents at least once every two years on patterns of early learning and childcare provision. This will increase parental choice and better meet the needs of families. 
Briefly, Mr. Kidd. I thank the Minister and her expected progeny for that response. I have <coughs> <I've> received a <laughs> number of contacts um, from concerned constituents who tell me that they continue to have problems with flexibility and responsiveness of local circumstances. Is there a route for addressing the inefficient system in Glasgow <clears throat> where some parents must pay for their child's nursery place in partnership nurseries up front and then have to claim uh, the money back? Minister, I think it's you we want the answer from. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you, and I wouldn't blame any answer on any baby brain. Um, Glasgow, like all local authorities, is under a duty to consult with parents on the patterns of provisions that would best meet uh, their needs. And we recognise that the move away from what has been a default model of two and a half hours a day towards a more flexible model will take time and additional funding has been provided for that. It is for private partner nurseries as independent businesses to make chain charging arrangements and that partnership contract between the council and partners asks that they are transparent and communicate with parents regarding how the funding will be applied but the detail is left to the individual partner provider to decide what suits their business model. I am happy though to meet with a member to discuss some of the specifics, although that might have to be Fiona McLeod who will uh, take up that uh, meeting for Bill Kidd. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to First Minister.